We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah. And may his finest peace and blessings be upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. So I was uh, supposed to reflect on the battle of Badr with everyone. Uh, how we're going to do that, the events of the battle on their own would consume our 30 minutes and beyond. Uh, and so... And I'm sorry for the background. <laughs> I'm uh, I do that sometimes. I, I visit family, and then this is the only quiet place I can uh, stream from. So, hope it's not too distracting. Uh, I'm in the countryside. So, the Battle of Bedr. So, the Battle of Bedr happened in the second year after Hijrah, right? The second year after our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam migrated to uh, Medina. It happened during the month of Ramadan. This was the first major battle that the Muslims uh, took part in. And that by itself should be a lesson for people that could be bothered by the discussion on Islam and violence. Islam being, you know, uh, a warlord religion or whatnot. You know, just knowing that factoid, that little nugget of Muslims did not even defend themselves for the first 13 years not because we're absolute pacifists, but for a greater wisdom, for the greater good, Allah commanded his prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the Muslims to restrain themselves. And then they go to Medina, two years into Medina, they're allowed to defend themselves to begin with. And then later on, after defending themselves from multiple battles, they were allowed to subdue their enemy because it just, you can't play defense forever. You, you, a punch will eventually get in if you stay in the corner receiving punches, as they say in boxing language, right? And then after that, at the very end of the Prophet Alaihi's life, he went on different kinds of offensives when there were like tyrannical regimes that were uh, uh, so oppressive. And so liberating the masses so that they can enjoy their freedoms and choose their religions was what his offensive campaigns were about at the end of his life. But ultimately, you're talking about the Prophet والسلام, whose mission was 23 years. The first 15 of them, he was not even allowed to fight. Right. And so everything that happened after that, you're talking about eight years and for very good reasons. So I just wanted to put that on the table because it's extremely useful. So permission was granted for them to fight, but they didn't know that they were going to fight. So you see, Allah Azza wa Jal discusses in Surah Al-Anfal a great deal of the events of Badr, the Battle of Badr. In the first page, Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَمَا أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ Your Lord caused you to leave your dwellings with every right to do so. This is referring to the fact that news reached the Muslims in Medina that Abu Sufyan, one of the leaders of, of the pagans in Mecca, the pagans of Quraysh, was passing by on a trade route with a whole bunch of goods. And so the Muslims went to go confiscate those goods. Why? Because they had every right to confiscate those goods. They were forced into exile. They had to lose their savings, lose their livelihoods, lose their family members, and they were forced out of Mecca. So that caravan would have represented a bit of what was taken from them, retrieving only a bit of it. Okay. So they head out with whoever can get out of Medina in time because they have to chase down this caravan, intercept it. And so the Muslims that were available at that announcement were about 315, 317 Muslims. And they did not come out to fight. They were just going to outnumber the caravan and confiscate it. And so they only had, you know, the, the on-hand weapons, basically, what any traveler would have. You know, just like your stick and your little sword. No armor, no might, no horses, no steeds. There was one or two horses in those 315, 317 uh, Muslims that were at Badr and maybe there were 60 70 camels which you're either riding or slaughtering for food by the way uh, so that was that and so news got to uh, Mecca that Muhammad and the companions are trying to insert intercept your trade caravan and so they riled up the armies they spent money they pushed each other they shamed each other uh, you have to go out many of them didn't even want to uh, and so they mobilized an army and that is how the two groups uh, wound up at this field, the field of Badr. Badr is a well uh, in a place close to Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ's companions, they were able to apprehend two of the scouts of the Mushrikeen. And when they brought them to the Prophet ﷺ, he asked them certain questions. How many are you? They said, we don't know. Where are you? They said that they're behind this hill. 
he, he said, Tab, how many do you slaughter every day? How many camels for food? They said nine one day, ten the other day. It's between nine and ten camels we slaughter every day. And so the Prophet وسلم, said to the Sahaba, they are between 900 and 1,000. And Muslims are now unprepared artillery-wise and outnumbered three to one. Huge disadvantage. Uh, and so he asked the Sahaba, what do you want to do? Abu Bakr and Umar and the senior Sahaba, the earliest Sahaba said, you know, we're ready for whatever. That doesn't matter. And the Prophet ﷺ kept thanking them and telling them, stand down, stand down. Until the Ansar, which were the majority of the 300, the Ansar, the people in Medina, who took in the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba, they realized that he wanted them to speak up because they were the majority. And if they were not willing to live up to their earlier promise of defending the Prophet ﷺ, then they wouldn't be able to fight. Uh, and they said, Ya Rasulullah, we believed in you and we've accepted your message. Ya Rasulullah. If you were to walk into the ocean, we walk in after you. Ya Rasulullah, we are a people that are not afraid to meet our enemy tomorrow. We are true men in battle. And, you know, go where you want and don't go where you don't want and take from our money what you want, ask for it and leave what you want, meaning even if nothing at all. They said to him, and what you take from our money makes us happier than what you leave. We were happy at the opportunity to give, give it all for, for your sake and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Islam. And they said, and perhaps Allah Azza wa Jal will show you uh, tomorrow from us, from our, our mighty stand, that which will bring you great joy. You're going to see what we're like in battle. Uh, we are no joke, um, outnumbered or not, with weapons or not. And they said, Wallahi, we, you know, before that, they said, Wallahi, we will not say to you like the companions of Moses said to Moses. And then they, they recited the verses in Surah Al-Ma'idah. You know, when the companions of Moses were outside of the Holy Land and the tyrants were in front of them, they told Moses, Go you and your Lord and fight. We're staying right here. So the Sahaba said to him, the Medinan said to him, O Muhammad, O Prophet of Allah, go you and your Lord and fight. And we are fighting right by your side. And so the Prophet ﷺ was like super overjoyed at this. Uh, and he immediately went, because there was no time, he immediately went to stationing them. Uh, and so he stationed them in a certain place. And then one of the younger Sahaba, Al-Hubab ibn al-Mundir radiallahu anhu, he came to him and like you can, if you read between the lines, he came to him in the adab of the believer with his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I know you set us up to like line up here and station ourselves here for the battle. But is this like some place Allah told you to stay at? Or is this just like your strategy in your head? Just your tactics. He said, no, it's just warfare, strategy. He said, well, in that case, Ya Rasul, this is not the right place. We need to go by the wells, ruin all the wells so they can't have access to water. And we make our own exclusive access to the water so that we can have the upper hand, you know, have water in a desert in the middle of a fight. You can imagine. Uh, and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam acted on his advice. And of course, that's a huge lesson. In so many ways, the Sahaba did not say, oh, he's the prophet of God, mind your business, right? They understood that certain aspects of what the Prophet ﷺ said, and those are the default, of course, are concrete issues, which, you know, we, we accept with our eyes closed, even if we don't fully understand. But there are other issues that could be speculative. And that's very important for every Muslim to know. You know, not every fact that you know, quote unquote, about Islam is necessarily grounded in Islam. Islam has constants and concrete aspects, the aspects that are crystal clear in the Quran and Sunnah, the aspects that all the scholars of Sunni Islam agree on. Then there's other aspects that are like matters of interpretation. And then there are aspects that are just culture, that are just opinion, that Muslims you respect have. You know, the reason I say that is because sometimes, like if we were in Al-Hubab's place, we could say, okay, even if it's not like revelation from God to keep the army here, his human opinion is better than mine. <laughs> and... So you learn from this that if you have something that is not contrary to Islam, even if people superior are, you know, are around, don't hold back. Offer a suggestion. It could change the course of history. That's actually happened so many times. You don't realize the effects of your suggestion, your word, until after the fact. And then also, you know, think of the humility of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the, the Prophet of God. This is the head of state. This is the commander in chief, right? He, he, he noticed his humility there. He had no problem saying, okay, let's change positions. Let's listen to Al-Hubab. Seems like he knows what he's talking about, right? That actually happened so many times in Badr. You know, of those times is that 
due to how few rides they had, few camels they had, three people would alternate on one camel. Two would walk, one would ride, and they would just cycle through. And so the Prophet ﷺ had two people as well that he would take turns with. And whenever it was their turn, they'd say, Ya Rasulullah, you can have my turn. Just you stay on, you stay on. And he would say to them, absolutely not. I am no less capable of walking than you. And you are no more in need of the reward than me. Like I can walk as well as you can, and I need the reward as much as you do. It's just beautiful humility from the Prophet ﷺ. And so he stations them. And then that evening, the Quran, Surah Anfal, by the way, um, these are all ayat of Surah Anfal. He talks about this, that, you know, rain befell that, that field, that, you know, that plain, that ba the battle plains. And it's not a huge place, that area, that plateau where they fought. And, but what's really interesting, I'm talking about battle and horses, <laughs> and horses are trotting behind me. This is cool. It works out nice. It's convenient. So, uh, they're about to, you know, they're receiving rain, but Allah says, this is not just like, you know, some ambiguous history. Allah Azza wa Jal said that he caused the rain to fall a certain way on the believers in a completely different way on the disbelieving army, on the pagan army. So Allah says he sent down this rainfall on you لِيُطَهِرَكُمْ to purify you. Because some of them had needed to take a bath to be able to pray in the morning. غُسُلْ and to, to get rid of the whispers of shaitan, shaitan was like nagging at them that how are you even going to fight when you can't pray because you can't take a bath or how are you going to, and they're also, you can imagine like the amount of like fear, anxiety they're having that night after realizing there's no running from this, outnumbered three to one, and we don't even have weapons, we don't have horses, all of that. Allah sent this rain down to just cleanse them and clear them, uh, and that's not the only thing he sent. And also he said, It was lighter rain which anchored their feet. In other words, the sand in the desert was moistened so it became firm. Their feet wouldn't sink in it. On the other side, very close, they received a downpour which kind of like flooded, flooded their ranks. And there was too much rain on that side and just bothered them the whole night and they were like walking in mud and it was extremely difficult. Subhanallah. And then the ayah says also, and then recollect once again of the favors I granted you at Badr when the night before the battle all of you fell asleep this happened at multiple battles you know uh, that you know the, the night before you know when you have just like an appointment in the morning you can't think straight you have like a, oh man what if I miss my flight in the morning you can't think straight these people are about to collide with their oppressors the people that have traumatized them the people that have killed their family members the people that were torturing them for years they're about to clash with them in the morning after coming after their goods and all of this. And they just all have the most restful sleep. Allah causes them all to knock out and have the most peaceful, restful sleep. Every single one of them just had a, had a perfect night's sleep and were asleep except for one person. That was the Prophet wasallam, who spent his night in prayer. Uh, beseeching Allah, pleading with Allah Azza wa Jal to carry this army, to clothe them, to to uh, to feed them, to grant them, uh, to quench them. When he's saying these things, by the way, that you can imagine their condition, uh, impromptu army, essentially. And you know what's beautiful about the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at Badr is that it continued. Like even on the battlefield, there are narrations that in the middle of the fight, well, like when, obviously when he when there was like a moment or a pause or, you know, a, 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 an aside that he would go to, he would lift his hands and say, oh Allah, grant me the victory you promised. Grant, and of course it's not, you know, Billah, speaking assertively to Allah in the high horse sense. This is him saying, oh Allah, grant me the victory because I know your promise is true. Grant me the victory you promised me. Grant me the victory you've promised me. Oh Allah, if you allow this battalion or this army to be destroyed, you will not be worshipped again on earth. What's crazy also about the Battle of Badr, and it's a great lesson, is that the, the historians collect and document, like from witnesses there, that the other side, the pagans were making dua as well. Like the leader of the pagans, of the Qurashiyu and the idol worshippers, uh, Abu Jahl, Abu Jahl is like, you know, the, the arch enemy of the Prophet والسلام, He was making nearly the exact same dua to Allah 
but you know when the battle is starting saying oh allah this man destroyed our families oh allah this man uh you know uh, insulted our elders and our forefathers oh allah uh grant us the victory and destroy this man oh allah give victory to the more beloved of the two groups to you can you imagine the delusion and this is one of two things this is either number one, he's just seeing the, the hesitation in the ranks, and so he's trying to pick up the morale of his army. Or number two, more likely, is that he actually has lied so many times that he actually believes this now. And, you know, th that is what happens. You know, Abu Jahl for sure saw miracle after miracle, proof after proof, admitted himself this Quran was unexplainable, supernatural, saw the moon split, all of this, and then you just keep going. And when you keep going like this and you keep ignoring the light, Allah turns off your eyes, right? You no longer, you know, see uh, straight anymore. And so you act, and all throughout, by the way, you know, many times people look at tyrants and they say, you know, this guy carrying the baby or acting so cute or saying he's doing this in the name of humanity. We have that all throughout the Quran. Fir'aun said this, you know, I will not let Moses corrupt your lands, you know? you could say, oh man, these liars, right? These politicians. It is very possible, not all of them, obviously. Some of them could not even know that they're lying anymore because they've just said this lie so many times and they've surrounded themselves with like people, bootlickers, as we call them, right? Bandwagoners that keep telling them, yeah, yeah. So they actually believe I am a great guy. I really am compassionate. I am funny because everyone laughs at my jokes. He just, the echo chamber does that. Well, billah. And so the battle begins. It is 624. The battle begins. So what happens in the battle? Lots of things happen in the battle. So it was customary. Let me say this first. It was customary for, you know, fights, wars in the past to begin with duel. Duels, like one-on-ones, right? A few number of people going at each other. Because this, like, they take, like, a, a premonition or a good omen or, you know, it's symbolic of who's going to win. It's good for the morale. My hero versus your hero. My champ versus your champ. And so uh, the Quraysh, the pagans, called out the Muslims to send out their three best. And so men from the Ansar, the Medinans, they were eager to prove what they said last night to the Prophet. So they jumped up and the, the Quraysh sent them back, said, we're not going to fight you. We want our people, our cousins, our sons, our nephews, meaning fellow Qurayshis, people from Mecca. And so the Prophet wasallam said, Oh, Hamza, get up. Hamza is his uncle. Oh, Ali, get up. Ali is his cousin. Oh, Ubaid ibn al-Harith, uh, who is his cousin, get up. Uh, and so he sent his own family members to fight first. And this is of the reasons why he was the most beloved person in the world to them. He was not like those leaders who isolated himself from his people, from his army, from his nation, from, you know, uh, the masses, from the populace. He was never like that, alayhi salatu wasalam. In fact, and I'm fast forwarding a little bit here, Ali himself, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no one was braver than the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the most brave of us was the one that could stay behind, stay by his side, like who can contend with him, alongside him, obviously not fight with him, meaning can inch close to the enemy the way he does when the battles get intense, and he was the closest of us to the enemy. He was not in the back somewhere. He was the closest of us in the enemy. And nobody was tougher than him in battle. And so, you know, Hamza vanquishes the man he's dueling. Ali vanquishes the man he's dueling. Ubaid ibn al-Harith, radiallahu anhu, they both hurt each other, but no one dies. So Hamza and Ali get to that third man and they pull back Ubaid ibn Harith radiallahu anhu back to the Muslim camp. He does die later, radiallahu anhu. He is martyred later, but this is huge. Like the battle hasn't even started yet. And three people and before them, a fourth person who swore he would get to the well from the pagans, swore he would get to the well. And Hamza took him down and, and made sure he didn't keep his promise. Uh, and so now four people from Quraysh had just fallen, big names, before the battle ever uh, started. And so now the, the ranks are coming at each other and the Prophet wasallam gives them very specific instructions. And this is a very important lesson. You know, he said to the people, hold back your arrows, your arrows until they are close. 
and don't pull out your swords until they assault you. What is he saying here? Be strategic. You know, someone like in the fervent of battle could like, you know, be anxious and then you waste your artillery. You waste your arrows, you know, just out of nervousness before the army even becomes close enough to be hit by them. So he's trying to say, be careful with your ammunition. It's not unlimited and don't rush to use your swords like stay together let them come to you so that they have to deal with a wall you know you guys are going to run at different paces but if they come at you you're all lined up like bricks connecting one another as the ayah and sort of the says allah loves to see you uh lined up in these ranks like a, a building that is holding itself together or bricks that are holding themselves together what is the lesson here the lesson here is uh, that <laughs> Our Prophet والسلام, our Islam taught us the real way to balance between putting your trust in God and doing your part. It's not like it doesn't matter how many they are. Remember he asked how many are there and then he calculated and said they must be 900 to 1000. And now he's saying careful with your arrows, you know, careful about walking out and, you know, dividing the ranks. He is being extremely methodical here. والسلام. So you do everything in life as if it's all up to you while sure that everything ultimately is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So relying on Allah in a word, in a word, relying on Allah is an action of the heart, not an action of the limbs. And if you understand that and do that correctly, what you do with your limbs will be even more productive. Will be even, because you're not thinking that relying on the heart is enough. You're saying, okay, reliance is just here. It's not supposed to be affecting my limbs. And then when you're using your limbs, your assets, your faculties to, to pursue what you see as good, to pursue goals in life, your anchor in here will, will get you to do more and more and get you to be firmer and more balanced and more consistent and more resilient in your strides, inshallah ta'ala. And so after he gives these instructions, that's it. There's nothing left but to brace the Muslims. And this is going to be my last 10, 12 minutes. And it is the most important lesson about the heroes of Bedr now that I was, you know, I think specifically asked to, to spend some time on. There was, you know, this horrific scene in front of them. I already told you the odds, the numbers, the preparations, the resources, everything, right? Even the food supply, right? And so there was one thing that could uh, give the Muslims the upper hand and have stronger wills and stronger hearts to not waver at this moment. And that was the solid, uncompromising, you know, focus they had on Jannah, on paradise. This is so obvious in Bedr, before Bedr, after Bedr, but let's just capture it from Bedr. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they, you know, the, Allah, his messenger, the hereafter, that was everything. You know, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, radiallahu anhu, he said, I was standing there in the ranks of Bed, and this young man, Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn Jamuh, came up to me, or like he was standing next to me in the rank, and I wished someone else was standing next to me. Like, ah, this, like of all people, like I wanted some, because Mu'adh was 15. But then all of a sudden, he said, as I'm thinking about that, like, man, if only someone tougher could be by my side, you know, shoulder to shoulder with me, he nudges me and says, uncle, do you know who Abu Jahl is? He said, yes, I know who Abu Jahl is. He said, can you point him out to me when the battle starts? He said, what do you want with Abu Jahl? He said, I heard that he used to curse the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I swear I will not meet him except one of us has to fall. I, nothing is going to get me off of him, basically, unless I die or he does. And he said, just as I was sitting there wondering like how like valiant and courageous this young man is, a young man on my left, asks me the same exact question. And by the way, after the Battle of Badr, they, they actually argued, those two, with, uh, in front of the Prophet وسلم, which of the two actually killed Abu Jahl. Uh, you know, a 16-year-old at the Battle of Badr was Umair ibn Abi Waqqas. Umair, Umair ibn Abi Waqqas, radiallahu anhu. He was, by our standards today, under 18, he was a child, right? Uh, but in the eyes of Allah, in the proper standards in this world as well, he was a giant. Before the Battle of Bedr, he was found hiding. He was not hiding out of the fear of death. Like it could be argued that he was hiding 
out of fear that he wouldn't die. <laughs> that sounds wrong. No, Islam is not a death cult. You know that, and we know this. But what do I mean? It means that someone of his age was not sick of life, was not being suicidal, was not a failure, none of this, right? But still, he understood this is this is the worthiest ambition. He understood what the most intelligent, accomplished people, materialistically speaking, don't understand for 60, 70, 80 years. He was hiding from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam out of fear that he would send him back and not give him an opportunity to be a martyr, to be a shaheed, you know, to show Allah Azza wa Jal that he will not run. Uh, even if that meant his life, not that he's going there to, to volunteer his life. And so the Prophet والسلام, did, when he caught him, like he saw him, he did in fact discourage him coming out. And so the man, he cried, the boy cried, the man cried that he wasn't going to have the opportunity that these men were going to have. And so the Prophet والسلام, did in fact permit him in the end. You know, another example is Umayr ibn al-Humam, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. You know, when it was time, like I said, last, last moments, to rise, the Prophet والسلام, said, ila Rise to a paradise that is as wide or wider than the heavens and the earth, the skies and the earth. And so Umair said, bakhin bakh. as, You know, like, bakhin bakh is basically, wow, wow, like, what is this? And so the Prophet والسلام, said, what makes you say that? Like, is it the size of the army in front of you? Are you like intimidated? What made you say it? Uh, he said, nothing, O Messenger of Allah, except my hopes, my wishes to be among its people. Like a paradise that big. I can, that I can actually be uh, of its people. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us and you of its people. He said, only my wish that I could be of its people, the people of Jannah. And so he said to him, you are of its people. And so he had a small pouch with him. This pouch had dates in it. Dates. Snack. There's no food. Uh, they would suck on dates and split dates. May Allah be pleased with them. Uh, so he took out these dates and he said, if I have to live long enough to eat these dates, that's already too long of a life. Like what dates? is like this is what is between me right now and paradise then this is too long of a life right like what dates like what about the dates of jannah and the drinks of jannah and the food of jannah and the company of paradise of jannah and so he threw the dates down and he went forward and he fought valiantly till he ultimately fell and we are positive that he went to jannah because the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said right and min ahliha you are of its people you know, another person at Bedr was Sa'ad ibn Khaythama. Sa'ad ibn Khaythama radiallahu anhu. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the announcement, whoever's ready, we're, we're leaving Medina. We're leaving. We got to go. We got to move fast. Like I said, they were just going to get the caravan. Uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Khaythama and his father, uh, they debated which one of us should go. Like someone has to stay behind with the family and someone needs to go. So they had this the discussion. And like, again, it wasn't a command, an obligation to go. It's whoever's ready, go. So only one of them could be ready. One of them went, uh, got on their camel or whatever it is, and they set off. They're going to be, they could agree. This is, <laughs> the whole family wants Jannah, right? They couldn't agree. And so they basically cast lots. It's the equivalent of flipping a coin. And so when Sa'ad was the one who got to go, the son, his father said to him, give it to your dad. Like, it's your right. I can't take it from you now. You know, the, the flip came in your favor. Allow me permission to go. He said to his father, I want you to pay attention to this. He said, Wallahi, law kana al -jannah, la faalt. If you were asking me to give you precedence over myself in anything other than Jannah, I would have done it. But I can't. Though. I cannot get, let anything get in this way and interfere. I can't be at the door of Jannah and say, no, 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 you first. This is the mentality that all of the Sahaba had. And, and I want you to fixate on that, whoever is listening to me. No matter what you do in life, no matter, you, many of you will get married and have children and have careers and you might have accolades in your careers and become accomplished. None, none of this should ever matter 
at the expense of Jannah. Yes, you know, have your career path and be conscientious in your career and, and be a good example for Islam and the Muslims and be a person of integrity and be above average. All of that, but not here. That not at the expense of this space. This space is sacred. And I'll share with you a final story and close. Uh, um Haritha uh, ibn Suraqa, the mother of Haritha ibn Suraqa. Uh, you know, after the Battle of Badr, when they returned, Allah Azza granted them victory. Of course, uh, Haritha was of those who died. And so they went back and they informed her that your son has died. And you know, news like this, uh, this is when people lose it, right? When, when they get information like this suddenly and unexpectedly, and it was not known to be a battle, right? The suddenness adds and compounds the, the anguish. So it is expected. This is when people, old and young and men and women, this is when they, you know, their, their legs don't carry them. This is when they fall apart. So, but she had a very, very uh, different reaction that showed her humanness, that showed her motherhood and her motherly compassion, but at the same time, her fixation on the fact that this is not life compared to the next life, that is our true life. She went, when she heard her son died, she said, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, you know what Haritha meant to me. Like, you know how much I loved my son. You know. You know what Haritha meant to me. So tell me, like, tell me what happened with Haritha. She knows he died. Like, she means after death. So tell me. Tell me more about Haritha. Quickly, like, put my heart to rest. She said, because if he is in Jannah, I will be patient and I will anticipate the reward. I mean, I'll await the reunion. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll be able to take it. She said, when can غَيْرَ ذلك, But if it's anything else but that, what you have to tell me, you will see what I will do. In other words, like you will see that I'm not going to be able to handle it. I'm going to fall apart if he's not in Jannah. And so the Prophet وسلم, said to her, Ajuninti, O mother of Haritha, did you lose your mind? Like, of course, I hear this in a compassionate voice, right? This is an expression meaning, like, have you lost your sense? Like, the promise is true. Absolutely. But then he said something, he just said, Oh, mother of Haritha, no. He said, and who said it is a Jannah? It is not a Jannah. It is not a paradise. It is not a garden. Innaha jinan. It is gardens, right? Yes, it's called a garden, but it's gardens. He said, And your son has attained its very highest level, the level of al-Firdaus. You know that the Prophet ﷺ said in other hadith, Al-Firdaus is the center of paradise and the height of paradise. And out of it spring the, the rivers, begin, erupt the rivers of paradise. Uh, and its roof or its ceiling is Arshur Rahman, the throne of the most merciful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so she found peace in that. May Allah be pleased with our heroes and allow us to keep recollecting their story until the sparks cause a flame to ignite within us and accelerate us towards the right places and the right standing. May Allah beautify our journey to him and, you know, perfect our standing before him and forgive us our negligence and our disobedience towards him. May Allah Azza wa Jal send his finest peace and blessings upon his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and every last one of the members of his household and his noble companions and gather us with them in a rafiq al-a'la. Allahumma ameen. Zakla khayn everybody.